Hello, I'm Casey Dinges, Senior Managing Director for Public Affairs, Membership and Marketing at the American Society of Civil Engineers. Thanks for joining us for a discussion about shale energy exploration and development. My guest today is Doug Duncan, Acting Coordinator, Energy Resources Program, U.S. Geological Survey. Doug was a well-received speaker at ASCE's first shale energy engineering conference last month. Doug, hydraulic fracturing has become a growing method to extract new energy resources, yet it does raise environmental health and safety concerns. Civil engineers are playing a larger role in energy production than in the past due to these concerns. Has shale energy development itself caused any induced seismic activity in the U.S., or have all cases been limited to deep well injection or other activities? You know, the whole issue of induced seismicity is important to civil engineers because if this is not a situation that can be controlled, but we think that it can be controlled, then you have significantly more earthquakes in areas that didn't have them before and the building codes have to be changed. Sure. So the process of hydraulic fracturing actually relies on the creation of a whole bunch of tiny little earthquakes called micro seismic events. Mm -hmm. And those events are almost never felt. So it, if you were at the surface, you wouldn't feel it. And in no case that I'm aware of has it caused any kind of structural damage. On the other hand, when you produce unconventional oil and gas, regardless of whether you use hydraulic fracturing or not, that process often produces a lot of wastewater. It's mm -hmm. saline water, it's very, very salty, briny water. It has to be disposed of somehow. And a common method for that is to dispose it in a deep underground injection well. And that process is very much known to cause earthquakes that can be felt and in fact can cause damage. There really has been structural damage due to seismicity related to deep well injection activities. Yes, the Prague, Oklahoma earthquake caused chimneys to collapse and these are areas where the buildings are not constructed because they are in a seismic area. So they're not expecting this sort of activity in most of the mid-continent area. So this dramatic increase in the number of earthquakes in the last few years has kind of taken them by surprise. Uh, Oklahoma, for example, is the most seismically active state in the lower 48 right now. And that wasn't the case before this technology was put into use? No, in fact, it, it's clearly related to the injection of these wastewaters. Okay, and there's consensus within the scientific community on this? I think there's general consensus. And it's an area of active research at the USGS and universities and state geological surveys. And so there's an emerging body of research. But it is something that can be controlled. Okay. Let's move beyond seismicity for a moment here. How can the communication of fracking fluid to an aquifer be prevented? Well, the, it starts with the design of the well. So it needs to be designed so that the casing, which is the steel pipe that goes down into the hole that was drilled, is isolated through any kind of underground water bearing zones, aquifers. And so that's done by putting cement in between the steel casing and the rock that the well was drilled through. And you need to do that all the way through all of the freshwater zones. What are the long-term consequences of a poor quality capping of an exhausted shale gas well? Well, I think the main problem would be the communication of contaminated fluids or oil and gas from the deep production zone up into freshwater zones such as aquifers. And another problem would be if somebody were, a company were fracking nearby and the high pressure fluids from depth could make their way to this pre-existing well and then make it up through that well into the aquifer or even to the surface. So Doug, how much is out there? What kind of an energy resource you know, do we have here? So 10 years ago, it was essentially nothing, you know, a few trillion cubic feet. And now it's probably um, 700 or 800 trillion cubic feet of gas. And mm -hmm. what that means is it's what's out there yet to be found. It's okay. different from what's in reserve and we have a lot of reserves in the United States as well, both conventional and unconventional. So when people say this is a game changer, that's not hyperbole, is no. it? No, it's absolutely a game changer. Or do you see any areas of, of focus or research that, that need to continue? Yeah, I think there's certainly a need for further research. I think the states are getting better and better at understanding what these risks are and adjusting their regulations. I think some states have best practices mm -hmm. that are implemented into their regulations and as well the Bureau of Land Management which does the permitting on federal lands 
they also are learning how to implement better practices, if you will. Mm, that's very encouraging. What advice would you give civil engineers as they design and construct platforms for shale energy exploration and development? Yeah, if you're talking about the well pads and pipeline corridors and that sort of thing, I think uh, one idea would be to try to have setbacks from nearby water sources, mm -hmm. surface water sources. Mm -hmm. I think trying to cluster the infrastructure as much as possible so that you don't cause as much forest fragmentation, for example. Those sorts of practices are things that could be implemented. I've heard some leaders in the environmental community talk about the methane uh, issue related to fracking. Can the escape of methane from shale gas wells be minimized? And what are some of the other environmental aspects of shale, oil, and gas development? Well, on that first question, yeah, definitely the emission of methane, so-called fugitive gas, can be controlled. And there are a number of ways of doing that. And in general, those are known as a green completion. And it's the containment of the fluids and the gases at the time the well is being drilled, as well as when it's put into production, so that those emissions of methane, or natural gas, are minimized to the extent possible. Um, your second question had to do with other environmental issues. Yeah. There are a number of them. I think one category is groundwater quantity and surface water quantity. This process of hydraulic fracturing takes a lot of water. And so you can either get that from surface water sources or from, from groundwater aquifers. Mm -hmm. And in areas where you have a limited watershed or in arid areas where water is at a premium, then it can be a problem having enough water. Another problem would be groundwater quality and surface water quality. You can have contamination caused by spills, for example, of, of chemicals that are making their way to the well site or this waste water that I was talking about that needs to be disposed of, that has to be trucked or pipelined away. Mm -hmm. And so there can be spills associated with that as well. Another area of environmental concern is air quality. Mm -hmm. You mentioned methane mm -hmm. emissions, these fugitive emissions, but as well there are combustion products from diesel engines. Mm -hmm. Many, many tons of sand are used in the fracking of a well and there are issues associated with air quality and um, workers breathing. Uh, silica particles. Another area would be landscape impacts because you're creating roads and drilling sites and pipelines and compressor stations and those sorts of things and all of those can impact the landscape if you will. Doug, thank you for joining me today for this very informative discussion. For more information visit ASE's website at ASCE.org. Thanks for tuning in today and join us next time on the ASCE Interchange.